So Britain is scrapping poetry for diversity. The UK is now dropping classic poets from the curriculum in favour of more diverse voices. Sure, why not? Indeed. Um, so as we read here in the Times, uh, they've removed Wilfred Owen and Philip Larkin and replaced them with more diverse voices. And let's see <laughs> okay. who they've got. So the conflict section of the poetry anthology contains none of the best known First World War poets. No remember, so, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I remember doing Wilfred Owen when I was, I don't know, must have been about 13 or something in mm -hmm. school. And I remember, like, you, you give them the setting. They're in these terrible trenches. And then, you, you know, you read the poem. And it really does strike hard. And even as a child, I was like, wow. It brings it to life. It, it really does. It gives you goosebumps. It really does. Um, so there's no seat freak Sassoon, no Rupert Brooke, no Robert Graves. Um, instead, it has new works, including We Lived Happily During the War by Ilya Kaminsky, who's a, a Ukrainian, Russian, Jewish, American poet, uh, which is a, I'm sure his work is very good. But how is that relevant to this country? Well, who said anything about this country? Well, this is the national yeah, curriculum. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Colonization in Reverse by Louise Bennett Coverley <laughs> and 13 by Caleb Femi. OCR said 15 new poems were included, 30 retained and 15 removed. The syllabus will be used in exams from the summer of 2024. I mean, this is a part of the ongoing project of the deconstruction of Britain. Yeah, this is the decolonisation of the curriculum, guys. Get with the programme. The exam board described the new poems as, quote, exciting and diverse, adding, our anthology for GCSE English literature students will feature many poets that have never been on a GCSE syllabus before and represent diverse voices. From living poets of British Somali, British Guyanese and Ukrainian heritage to one of the first black women of the 19th century America to publish a novel. Of the 15 poets whose work has been added, 14 are poets of colour. Six are black women. One is of South Asian heritage. And our new poets also include disabled and LGBTQ plus voices. Under the Conservative government. Under a Conservative government, yes, absolutely. They're dismantling Britain and colonising it with this American ideology. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, if... If this isn't colonization, what is? What yeah. have Ukrainians got to do with this? I mean, this? you would think that if they were advertising this, they would be telling us what's good about the poetry, not the poet. Yeah. Not, oh, they're of colour, they're women, they're of this heritage, there's this, that, the other. I mean, that's literally how I described Owen's poetry. I mm. told you what was good about the poems. Yeah, you did not <laughs> say, oh, I read when Wilfred Owen, and he was such a white man. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he was so straight. It just came... No, you don't. Like, that's <laughs> no. not... You talk about the poetry, Ugh. and uh, if the Telegraph has also commented on this, but uh, here we go. The lofty rigour of English literature may not traditionally be viewed as a Mickey Mouse degree, but it is one of the worst courses for graduate earning power and value for money. So this is a slightly different point, but I think it's curious, right? So the English literature graduates are, of course, the people who are compiling this new curricula. Yes. So maybe the reason it's not got great earning power is because it's not actually teaching the English language or English literature. It's instead brainwashing students into this diversity ideology. And maybe they're looking at this uh, as a way of, if we change the, uh, con the, the content of these, the, the courses, then maybe it opens up an access to LGBT funding yeah, in some way. There's that as well. There's yeah. many motivations to turn the courses into that. Um, but I do want to say, if you're doing an English literature degree purely for graduate earning power and value for money, you've comp even if that were true, <laughs> you have completely missed the point of an English literature degree. And it's a really stupid choice. I mean, you could have chosen anything. Well, no, I think there is value in an English literature oh, no, no, degree. No, no, no. no. I, I totally agree. There is a lot of value in an English literature degree. I'm not denigrating the English literature, mm -hmm. I'm saying as a means to make money, mm -hmm. you had a choice. You could have gone into business, you could have gone to IT, you could have gone to anything, and you chose English literature. You knew what you were doing. Yeah. You weren't doing it to get rich. And if mm -hmm. you were going to get rich, you're going to be very lucky, J.K. Rowling. Okay, maybe, you know, but most of the time you'll be uh, sacrificing for your art, say. Oh, I think so. Um, but it's interesting to note as well, as they quote again, um, roughly 40% of university degrees in any subject do not lead to an average salary above £30,000 within five years, the analysis found. So 40% of all degrees, all subjects, yeah. are not actually that much of a help for average salary. So if you are after earnings, you should probably consider a trade. Like, it's interesting how that shows they've devalued the worth of a degree mm -hmm. by absolutely flooding the universities with people. Yeah, 
absolutely. Um, and just someone speaking up for the value of um, of an English literature degree, we have Connor Tomlinson, who has appeared mm. on, the, on the Lotus Eaters before. English literature is a cornerstone of our civilization. He says, I value my degree because I did double the required reading. Others paid nine, gra nine grand a year to be woefully misinformed. It's sad to see critical theorists debase the discipline to turn it into a Trojan horse for socialism totally or other ideological bent. Totally correct. No, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, no criticism of English language and English literature. We love it. We basically have a living in it. You know, we're yeah. writers and presenters and so on. Um, language is useful. It's and story is one of the most powerful things that exists in human experience. So it's absolutely valuable when it's done properly. Um, sadly, it doesn't seem to be done properly. But back to the GCSE curriculum. Just as a quick yeah. aside, there, you, I, I think that's the most important thing, and this is what we've been talking about a lot. In fact, mm. uh, is that aside from direct personal experience, it seems that storytelling is the most effective way to teach someone a lesson yes. about something. Even people learning science, whether they realise it or not, are actually learning it through story, especially mm. in earlier stages of education, which is a little mind-blowing once you actually start to sit down and yeah. process that. Just giving people rote data to memorise is a terrible way of learning anything. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we, we, we're not under, undervaluing this at all here. No, of course not. There's a reason people don't memorise logarithm tables anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting that out there. Um, so if we move back to the GCSE curriculum, let's talk about the new anthology. It has three themes, love and relationships, conflict and youth and age. Now, I think that's a good choice of themes. You know. good themes yeah. uh, it also retains works by William Blake. Good. Emily Bronte. Also good. Sylvia Plath. All right. Your mileage may vary. And Carol Ann Duffy. Yeah. Uh, and adds the British Jamaican poet Raymond Antrobus, 36, and Kaminsky, 45, a Ukrainian American who is deaf. Got nothing to do with Britain then. Interesting. Okay. Uh, works by the British Somali poet Wasan Shire, 33, and uh, British Nigerian poet Teresa Lola, 28, both young people's laureates for London. Oh, great. great. More London, correct? Yeah. London culture. Illustrate the theme of youth and age. Brilliant. Okay. No, I like the idea of having young poets and old poets. That's all right. That's a, an interesting idea. Yeah, but I don't like idea. people from London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there is too much of a cultural concentration yeah. in London here. And uh, we will have a look at some of these people's poetry as well before the end of the second. Oh, brilliant. Uh, Judith Palmer, director of the Poetry Society, said, It's fantastic to see this new selection, including poets from such a range of backgrounds and identities, writing in such diverse forms, voices and styles. No, it isn't. Uh, Jill Duffy, OCR's chief objective, executive, said, This is an inspiring set of poems and that demonstrates our ongoing commitment to greater diversity. I hate the word diversity now. Yeah. Like, in, 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 in principle, like the idea of something being diverse, if you were to divorce it from its non-ideological context, mm -hmm. it is an appealing thing to have you know, a plurality of different... Well, it's contextually dependent. It's morally yeah. neutral, as a term. Well, yes. But, it, but it's often... Uh, an appealing and desirable thing to have. Diverse flavours, for example. It, it, I was literally dish. about to say that. Oh, you know, I don't want a, a meal that contains just one type of food. Mm -hmm. But when it when you're talking about like you know the 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 general overriding culture of a country, mm -hmm. it needs to have some sort of unifying theme to it. Yeah. You know, here's a Somalian perspective. Here's a Ukrainian perspective. So okay, but what's that have to do for an English school child mm -hmm. who's like, you know, what what does that connect them to, mm -hmm. and where does that lead them in the future? Exactly. No, that's a very good point. Um, however, Graham Chesters, who chairs the Philip Larkin Society, said, I find Larkin's exclusion very disappointing. It's a shame that youngsters will no longer be given a single example of Britain's greatest poet from the last century. But, as somebody once said, what will survive of Larkin will be his poetry, and that will not, thank goodness, depend on the whim of a GCSE exam board. That's well said. That is well said, yeah. So just to close this segment off, let's compare a new diverse poet with an old pale male stale English poet. So, Anthem for Doomed Youth by Wilfred Owen. What passing bells for these who die as cattle, only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle can patter out their hasty horizons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells, and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? 
not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall, their flowers the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk a drawing down of blinds. As I was saying earlier, it really brings it home to you. It's an incredible poem. Um, it's short, but it's very well constructed, and you, it immediately brings you into the trenches. Yes, you, you very much know you're in a trench surrounded by dead people, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of awful things happening around you. And there's so much going on in this poem that you could easily spend an hour of a lesson talking about what it does and mm. how it's constructed and the life of Wilfred Owen and how that is conveyed in the poetry and so on. Mm. Let's move forward to the 21st century. Oh, brilliant. After being called an effing foreigner in London Fields oh. by Raymond Antrobus. It's basically the same level of uh, torment. Because Dad slapped me every time I fell into the metal railings beside the swings, I was the first in school to cycle without trailing wheels. Dad's style of discipline didn't check for blood, just picked me up with one hand, red BMX in the other. His face a fist, come, come, pushed me along as I tried to breathe and balance the threat of a crash or punch. A presence I feel in my chest 25 years later, walking on the cycle path in the same park. I keep my father's words. Violence is always a failure, so I don't swing into the man's pale bag face when he throws his arms up to fight me. He carries on. But I think you've got the gist. I'll leave the viewer to decide which is the better poem to study. Yeah. Um, now, Antrobus has what you could call an inspiring life story. He was diagnosed with learning difficulties as a young child until it was discovered, I believe, that he was partially deaf, quite a hurdle for an aspiring poet. It's a shame, however, that in the modern age, the poet seems to be more important than the poem, and one is sadly led to wonder whether his disability might have proven a help rather than a hindrance to his career. But the one thing I can say in Antrobus's defence is that he has succeeded in his quest to make people more empathetic with deaf people. After listening to his poetry, I wish I were deaf too. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast to the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site, such as the Epoch series, this episode on the greatest knight of his age, William Marshall. Now, if you want to follow us and see what else we're putting out, we can follow us on Getter at, at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.